So this is lab one. We're going to start out by looking at the value of controls, which is talked about in your lab module under the safety, which is page six, which I have provided for you guys as that front page. Unfortunately, you'll notice there's some handwritten things in there. There's some typos that we've let the publisher know about, and they're a really good publisher, so um, once they're made aware of it, the next edition will have corrections. So I'm going to, um, I've already scanned this page in. I'll also put a copy of that uh, on Blackboard for you guys so you can make those corrections if you want in your individual lab manuals as well. Um, we just did ubiquity of microorganisms um, by exposing those plates. And then we're going to introduce the light microscope, and as I said, we're going to actually use it next week to look at all the eukaryotic organisms that you're going to be looking at in your book first and reading about. Um, then we'll actually look at them under the microscope. And so then I'll go over um, uh, how to properly focus and utilize uh, your microscope next, next lab period. So we have several terms throughout the course that we use. Um, and so it's important to be able to define them. By no means do I expect you guys to memorize definitions, but better have a better understanding of terms. Most of the time, we're going to ask you for the term, right? We're going to tell you some description of it, right? Um, and we could reword it. So it's important that you understand terms, right, as opposed to memorize terminology. Uh, but you do need to be able to spell all terminology as well, right? So if spelling is an issue for you, practice spelling. <laughs> um, so ubiquity is right in the title of uh, one of these labs, right? What, what did you guys find that it means? You could actually... Found in nature? Anywhere in nature, like anywhere. Like ubiquity is pretty much synonymous with everywhere, right? So we already know, right, from our exposure in general in life, most of us at this point, that microorganisms are found in the air, right? Are they in our bodies? Are they on our skin? Are they on our tabletops here? Outside in the soil and on the leaf, right? All these samples that we took, we expect to see microorganisms growing, right? Because we know microorganisms in general are found just about everywhere. I mean, there's probably, I can't actually think of a place where they're not. Can anyone think of a place where they're not? Only something that's been sterilized. <laughs> that's it, right? Um, they're really, truly everywhere. Air, ocean, uh, hydrothermal vent, probably um, well, magma that comes out of volcanoes. Probably the only thing that doesn't have microorganisms growing in. <laughs> that's about it. That's found on Earth. So I've used the term pathogen already, right? And most of you guys are familiar with it. So it's synonymous with something that can what? Cause disease, right? And, and the important part here, too, is that we know this organism is known to cause disease. Right? When we refer to something as a pathogen, we know it can cause disease. Non-pathogenic, right? Non-meaning. Again, but not known to cause disease. So just because we say something is non-pathogenic, <laughs> science is ever-changing, right? <laughs> The next day could actually be a pathogen. We just didn't know that it was a pathogen. Um, so it's not. Notice the not. Not known. Opportunistic pathogen, right? So we have to have some type of condition, right? An opportunity for it to cause disease. So ordinarily, it's not considered pathogenic. But will co cause disease when it's out of its normal habitat. The most common offenders for humans that are what we refer to as opportunistic pathogens are enteric bacteria. And so enteric refers to what region of your body? Your intestines. Yep. This is an informal name to the ones that it, uh, make up our intestinal tract. So for these guys, and this is the unfortunate thing as being a woman, guys don't have this problem, but you got to pay attention because you don't know. You might have to take care of a girl someday, some little girl. So don't tune me out, okay? Feces comes out our anus, yes? Close to that are two other very important holes, the vagina and the urethra. If bacteria 
from the intestines, enteric bacteria, get from that environment into one of those two environments, whether it be the vagina or the urethra, they can cause serious infections there, right? That opportunity of being in a different environment. So little girls are taught, when you go poop, you wipe from the front to the back, never forward, right? Because if you wipe forward, you're passing through those two other, you're passing over those two other holes, the vagina and the urethra. And there was a little girl in Louisiana several years back, died of something as simple as that because the bacteria got into her bladder, traveled up her ureters, into her kidneys. Parents didn't realize how sick she was by the time they seek medical attention she was too far gone, right? That simple, right? So little babies, right, when you gotta change their diaper, especially for little girls, you gotta be very careful with the good old poop. Guys, on the other hand, right, two holes, large distance depending between those two holes. They really don't have to worry about it, right? Ugh. But they don't get to have birth, get birth, you know? They don't get that choice. It really is a joy and strange experience all together. All right, any questions on these guys? So the same thing with the ones on your skin, if they get deeper into your body, they can be an opportunist pathogen. Can anyone think of one that we talk about quite a bit nowadays that causes lots of skin infections? Staphylococcus aureus, and then there's an even scarier strain because what is it? MRSA, and what does that actually stand for though? What's that MR? Mictalin resistance, and what, what are we talking about when we say resistance? Antibiotics, right? It's resistant to uh, a, a, an, a penicillin-like drug, which was very commonly used, and so it's very common that, that for the organism to have resistance to it now. So then we switch to another commonly used antibiotic. Anyone know what the next one in line was? And so therefore we now have resistance strains against that antibiotic too. Starts with a V. Vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. I don't know if they like say that one like Versa or not. I don't know. But those are actually abbreviations <laughs> that we make into these weird words. So uh, we've been talking about some of this stuff, right? So what, what do we actually define as a host? A host is typically we're talking about an organism, right? That survives in a habitat for another organism, right? So you are a host to your bacteria that live in your gut and on your skin. That relationship that you have with the bacteria, it could be a good one or a bad relationship. Commusal refers to what we would kind of consider not necessarily bad or good. Because commensal, I always have trouble saying that one and then right now even more so. So this is two organisms living together, right? So your bacteria, like for instance, in your gut, right? In this case, neither one is negatively or positively affected sometimes, right? This is like communism, supposedly. A mutualistic relationship, and I always, you know, the synonym to this one is marriage right M marriage who should benefit in a marriage both people both it so that's the way it's supposed to work right supposed to be a marriage a partnership both are supposed to benefit and so in this synergistic relationship you do a large number of the bacteria in your gut you actually benefit from does anyone know what they produce that is helpful to you that you absorb from your gut you're helping them. You gave them a place to live and you're giving them the extra food you don't digest. What are they giving you? What's folic acid? It's a vitamin. You don't produce it. Your bacteria do. And some of the food you eat may have it. And when you're pregnant, they believe it's very important for development, so they tell you to take supplemental vitamins to make sure that you get enough for the developing fetus. So they really do benefit you. And another area of benefit that most people don't even realize, too, is that those organisms being there and taking up that space in the food and the fact that they don't harm you or maybe they may even benefit you by producing vitamins for you, 
They protect you in by being there. Because they're there taking up that spot and eating that food, it's less likely if a pathogen comes along that they're going to have a spot to take up residence and have something to eat. And in fact, your good bacteria even usually outcompete the bad guys. They're like, this is my parking spot. I got here first. This is my Big Mac. You can't have it. I'm keeping it. <laughs> I will fight you for it. So those relationships make sense to you guys? Okay. So the next is reservoir. And this is typically when we're talking about non-human hosts. So things like animals, right? Although we are animals, we put ourselves on this little pedestal, right? I used to be a vet tech back in the day. I had to give my husband injections now, right? And I, and I said, well, you want to do it yourself or do you want me to do it? And, and, and then he said, I said, you know, I've given tons of injections. It's not a problem for me. I'm not afraid of needles or anything like that. I've given injections. He's like, yeah, to animals. And I'm like, oh, and you're not an animal, right? Mr. Human, better than all the rest of the animals. <laughs> so he lets me give him his injections, though. <laughs> Those insulin little needles are like nothing. You don't even feel the prick. So um, non-human, right? We're talking about animals other than us. <laughs> And other sites in nature. So where is some place, a site in nature you might want to avoid because it may have um, pathogens in it and you could therefore be exposed to them? The most common environmental thing. So think about it. If we walked outside, right, and we headed over to City Park, who's going swimming? Yeah, I would swim maybe, but not what? Drink it. That water? No? Yeah, no? Anyway, all those ducks and everything and the pretty swans out there. Yeah, no, I'll pass. Right? We'll go take a scoop of that water and we'll look at it next week, too. <laughs> or the pond water. Here, we got the pond right here, right? We know there are microorganisms that can make us sick, right? I ate dirt pies as a kid with Jimmy's even, right? The ants where I'm from weren't, you know, the ones that would kill you. So we had chocolate Jimmy dirt pies even. <laughs> I didn't die, right? I'm still here. Uh, but, you know, typically we, we wouldn't normally eat dirt, right? Okay. Good news, it wasn't a cow pasture I was eating dirt from. Because <laughs> then, you know, certainly wouldn't want to eat cow poop, right? Yeah. Wouldn't necessarily kill you, but could. Could make you sick. Free living. What do we refer to as free living? This is something that does not reside on or in a specific corpse. It does not have to, usually. right? So there are some that can exist in the soil on their own, in the water on their own. Don't need a living organism to survive. And because of that, most of them are not pathogenic, that we're aware of, right? Because usually pathogens rely on someone to be able to live. And when we refer to it as parasite, this relationship is not a good one, right? For the, the uh, if we're the host, right, to a parasite. Because in that relationship, who's benefiting in a parasitic relationship? Who's benefiting? The parasite, right? Not the host, right? You're usually harmed. Parasitic means that it's a harmful type relationship. Okay? So my, my best friend who works here, but she gets to take summers off. She's not here right now. She, um, she, she's a parasitologist. And uh, she used to call my son the ectoparasite, the endoparasite. And then when he was born, he became, became the ectoparasite. Not true. But, you know, kids can be a bit trained. <laughs> okay, so controls, right? Whenever we're doing experimental design, we have to have some parameters, right? And with this, sometimes we can run into some of these um, problems where um, it's difficult to tell the test results, right? So we can sometimes have false positives. What does that mean? It means that we observe what looks like a positive result in a sample that was expected to be negative. Right? So, if you never had sex, and we ran a pregnancy test and it came out positive, you'd be freaking out, I would think, right? 
because you would not expect that to be positive. So what's the explanation? Someone probably went wrong with the test, right? <laughs> if all those things are true, <laughs> what about a false negative? What does that mean? It means that we think it's negative, right? You take pregnancy tests and it comes out negative. Does that mean you're not pregnant? No, you could actually be pregnant. Right? Has to deal with what we refer to as sensitivity and specificity in testing. Right? So, what do we mean by sensitive? It means that the, the test itself has limitations. So when you end up with what's called a false negative, this is usually always a sensitivity issue. What does this mean? The test isn't sensitive enough to detect. So pregnancy test is the most easiest one for people to understand. Okay? So this is the case where you're pregnant, but the test result says negative. The reason for this is the way the pregnancy test is run is it detects the presence of a particular hormone in your urine, the one that you do over the counter. Okay? You have to have enough of that hormone, human chorionic growth hormone, present in that sample for the test to detect it. It has to be a certain concentration. And this is why they have limitations, right? And some of them are so excited because they've, they've really bumped up their sensitivity and you could take it, what, five days after your first missed period? and potentially detect the presence of this hormone. So they've really souped up the sensitivity, where in the past you'd have to wait longer because the, the longer your pregnancy goes, the more hormone you produce and the more spills over into your urine, right? Your urine is a byproduct. This is your body getting rid of it. So what, what sample could they take at a doctor's office typically that you maybe get a higher concentration of this hormone instead of urine? Blood, right? So a blood test, it, it's not necessarily a more sensitive test. It's that, you know, you can get, more likely get a better sample, more more concentrated sample of the hormone. Okay. Now, specificity, right? So how specific is the test? Right? What's the, what, how specific are we testing? When we get a positive result, do we know for sure you have human chorionic growth hormone? I'll tell you. That the pregnancy test is pretty spot on. If it comes out positive, don't do, take three more. Figure out what you're going to do. <laughs> right? I love that movie. What was that one with the little girl who got pregnant and she took like 12 pregnancy tests? All came up positive. Juno, yeah. It's funny. No, it's pretty spot on now. But, guess what? Guys can take this test and come out positive. What the heck? Let me say that again. Guys can take this test and can potentially come out positive. You guys have, we talked about this a minute ago, right? Guys have babies? No. no. So how does it come out positive? Yeah, right, yeah. They. I don't know how this happened. Who decided to test male urine? But um, there's something that they produce when they have um, certain forms of testicular cancer. And the pregnancy test, like the hormone it's testing for, I guess is similar to whatever it is that's overproduced for males under that condition, and so the pregnancy test could help. They're using it as an early detection for um, statistical cancer now. How crazy is that? <laughs> right? And that's, again, it's specificity, right? Um, there's something that it's detecting. It's not that they're pregnant, right? What is this test actually testing for specifically? Does that make sense to you guys? Right? So for women, we're looking for a particular hormone. I haven't found out. This is, a, this is a new thing that I learned. I haven't had a chance to research what it, what chemical is cross-reacting um, with the, what we test for with pregnancy tests. Kind of interesting stuff. Got to love science. <laughs> Do these make sense to you guys? Because this is going to be an important theme throughout the course, right? Understanding that you know there are limitations to the things that we do, right? And what type of limitation are we dealing with? Is it what we're actually testing for? Is it a specificity issue? Or is it a sensitivity, how, how the test works and what concentrations we might need to be in? So other things that we talk about are controls. And we already talked about this a little bit today. A control is a known entity 
predictable known outcome. So it's usually qualitative, right? Yes or no, not something we measure. Quantitative, right, is number-based, right, something we could measure. So there are two different types of controls we could have. Positive controls, we know the result, right, is going to be a positive. So, for example, again, with the pregnancy test, when you run that in that test, there's a built-in positive control. This is why there are two lines if you're pregnant and just one if you're not. One means the control worked, the test was great, your test sample did not contain it. Two lines, right, means control worked and your test sample shows the hormone, okay? Because it's two different test things, circumstances when they run that test. If you get no lines, and of course most of them have the fancy digital readouts now, but if you remove the digital thing, you'll still see the lines or not. If there's no lines, it's gonna tell you error, repeat test. It means that the control didn't work as it was supposed to, so the test is not valid, right? Make sense? Now, if we had, especially in that one, you want to really know if it's positive or not. And the test that we're running today, we pretty much know we're going to get bacterial growth from the samples we took, right? But the media that we started out with is what I said is sterile, which means what? No microorganisms. So even though I stuck it in the incubator and warmed it up, should we see any growth? No, so that's our negative control, right? We expect to see no growth. Anyone know why we did that? So we should get no growth. Let me think about this way. What happens if there's growth on those plates when I take them out? Where did those organisms come from? Where did they come from? And I lied to you, didn't I then? I said it was sterile. Was it, is it, if it's sterile, it's supposed to grow? No. Somehow we got what we refer to as being contaminated, right? So fingers and toes crossed. And this is also why I taped it shut, so less likely that it would potentially get open and get contaminated. So this tells us that the, the media that we started out with, we're controlling that, that it's sterile, there should be no bacteria, no viruses, no fungi, right, molds growing on these. But we know, right, and they're going to grow to such large numbers because we give them lots of food and keep them nice and warm, you're actually going to see the growth, right, with your own eyes. Just like you've seen at home, too, right? When mold grows to large numbers, you can see this on your bread or your fruits and things like that, right? And we'll get some of that, too, right, because the spores are in the air. Um, you can easily define, recognize that as opposed to bacteria. So we'll look at those large growths. A standard, on the other hand, is when we quantify things, when we actually assign a number to it. And this is done um, in a lot of different tests, right, that you may, may have run, right? When they run blood tests and stuff like that, right? They don't check to see if you have red blood cells in your blood. They check to see what? How many red blood cells you have, right? That's a quantitative test. And sometimes we have to have standardized controls so that we make sure the machinery or the technician is doing it correctly, right? So you have a standard that's run that we know the set number of red blood cells in that sample so that when we run our test sample, we know that it should be coming out correctly, right? That we're getting the correct information. So um, unknown, I don't like that this little thing is here. I don't know if I can get that to go away. It's blocking some of my slides. This is a new version. Okay, so an unknown is a sample whose outcome or value must be determined, right? So you guys will do this actually later in the semester. We know what organisms we're giving you. They're going to be numbered. But we're going to give you a bacteria organism, and you're going to run several tests on it, right, against known data to figure out what it is that we gave you. Right, so you'll have controls and standards for each of the tests. So, um, for instance, a protein assay that a scientist would do, like um, uh, Mr. Hickman that teaches one of the other labs, um, this is one that he actually did, 
and so they had set amounts of the the proteins. Proteins are tiny molecules, right? You can't see them with your eyes. They have them in suspension. We have um, machines called spectrophotometers that can measure, right, um, the cloudiness of a substance. And so you can see these are the values um, for the known amounts of the protein and the values on the spectrophotometer. And you can you can generate a straight line, right, a mathematical formula, right. And then of course computers generate most of this stuff nowadays, right. You plug it in, it it, it plots and graphs it for you, and you put it into the line formula and you can figure out any one of your unknowns, right? And we, and we want we want them all to line up as, as best they can. We want the best true line. So depending on the level of research you're doing, you might even actually use a formula that will take into account, right, or a program will take into account all the points. Um, so any unknown sample, right, you could have its absorbance and figure out what its concentration is. Right, and depending on which formula you're using, right, will determine your level of accuracy. By no means memorize, They're just re picture a representation for you guys to understand, right, why scientists may use quantitative type testing, right, when we want to know numbers, right. We're not going to do any of that type of testing in this lab. It's going to be a yes or no, right. So this is our chart that unfortunately um, for the formulas is in some inaccuracies. Right. So observed result, what the actual <coughs> expected result of the known controls are, right? If a known positive control comes out negative, excuse me, I'm all right. A known If a known negative comes out positive, it's probably a specificity issue, right? That it's detecting something that it's not supposed to. Right? So this is an example of like a male is not supposed to be pregnant, but why is this pregnancy test coming out positive? Because it's detecting something else. Right and causing it to be positive. A, a known positive result getting a negative result is usually a sensitivity issue, right? You probably don't have enough of the substance within the range of the testing that it pushes it over to positive, right? So it's just below, and, you're, and you, you see it as negative, when in fact that's not true. So Assuming no catastrophic error in technique or protocol, right? Because this could be, right? Could be our own fault the way it doesn't come out as it should. Um, false negatives, as I said, usually a sensitivity issue, right? We're not within, within the range. Um, and false positive is a specificity issue, right? Um, we've got something going awry. So the formulas that are in your book, are, the second one's a little bit off, and they have a four instead of an equal sign, <laughs> unfortunately. So if we take our true positives over our true negatives, as our, um, excuse me, false negatives go to zero for both of these cases, the falses, right, if we don't have that many false results, then you, we end up with true positive over true positives resulting in sensitivity and true negatives and true negatives resulting uh, with specificity. Um, then this is one, right? And that's what we want. We don't want any false results is what I'm saying, right? The likelihood when we're running particular tests, we want the lowest number possible of false results so that we have the greatest um, sensitivity and specificity of those tests. The good news is we won't mathematically figure this out. We're not doing multiple testing, right? But mathematically, we could look at several tests and actually get a number for how sensitive a test is, right? or how specific a test is. All right, so this brings us to today's experiment. And these are questions that are in your book and in your homework. So if you haven't answered it yet for um, the Ubiquity Lab, you may want to do so. So they ask you, what is the purpose of incubating unopened plates? So why do we 
incubate them. They are our controls, right? So what's an appropriate label for these plates? Control, but more specific, in this case, they should come out positive or negative. They're negative controls, right? We should have no growth. So the unopened plates show sterility of the media, the food, right? Media is food prior to exposure. So control or no exposure, and actually I don't have my negative written in there. Surprise Peter didn't catch that. <laughs> Okay, but what else did we put on these plates? What other important information do usually scientists include on things that they do? Date. In this case, we did te different temperatures as well as identifying with name or class, which I was lazy today and didn't do that. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna label the whole stack. All right. So any any factors or any identifiable information. So for our other plates, we put what the exposures were, right? We dated it, and we put the temperature, because we are using different temperatures. Some things are pretty standardized in this lab, right? Um, like 37 degrees, like I said, is a very common temperature. So a lot of times we don't bother writing 37. We usually write the temperature when we're not using 37, right? So um, our default is 37 if something has 25 or 30 written on it. Right, it's to indicate, don't put it in the 37. So typically, we usually write around the edge of the plate, and this is just to better be able to visualize um, the plate. And then also, where on the plate do we write? On the bottom, where the food is, right? The lid can be separated from the food, right? And therefore, that information could be um, disconnected and lost. So, we come back next week to look at these plates. If growth appears on both of our unopened plates, uh-oh, that's not good. What are some likely explanations? Why, why would we see growth? They were contaminated. How were they contaminated? Where did the contamination come from? The food source, right? Or the, the Petri dish? or the person making the prep, right? If you were in a clinical lab or a research lab, what would you have to do? Our negative controls didn't come out negative. Can we trust the rest of our experiment? No, we would have to do it again. But this isn't a research or clinical lab, it's a teaching lab. So we use this as what I call a teaching moment. If we get growth, we will not do this experiment again. <laughs> so what if it only, oh, I almost gave you guys the answer. So what if it only appears on one plate? Because remember, we got two different temperatures. So what could be a likely explanation for that? Yeah, contaminating maybe just that one plate. Plus, also, we're doing different temperatures. So it could be the organism, you know, only grows at one temperature and not the other, too, is another factor. Um, so the stock me media could be contaminated more likely, right, during the pouring or uh, during incubation um, so they get contaminated. Any growth on any control plate, right? In this case, it's our negative control. It should be no growth, right? So if we look at the plate from somebody's nose or mouth, how do we know that that bacteria actually came from their nose or mouth if our controls that were supposed to be sterile weren't? We don't, right? We don't know if it's a contaminant or if it actually came from the source that we tested, right? So our experiment would be bust, right? It would no longer be reliable. Any growth on either one of those plates. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. I've been lucky the past couple of semesters I haven't had any growth. Let's hope so.
So why did we, the next question asks you, what, why did we pick these particular exposures? Why are we doing air and, well, we didn't do hair. I don't like that one to come up right here. <laughs> In your lab manual, it says, you know, somebody scratched their head over it. I, I skipped that one. I do the mouth and nose. Those always come out nice. Uh, and uh, so you know, if, you'll, if you actually read it, I augmented this exercise a little bit. So, um, but why do we pick these types of things? The tabletop, the air, environmental sample, your hands, our mouths, our nose. What's the title of this lab? ubiquity which means everywhere so organisms are all around us right now right in us on us all over the place we just don't see them because this is remember what microbiology right why are we going to see them on these plates we're making them grow to very large numbers to the level that you actually can see them right so we're talking about millions upon billions, and Peter's going to help us figure out this semester about how many bacteria are in one of those little circles, what we call a colony, a growth, a bacteria. Now these guys, on the other hand, can you guys see that? That's not bacteria, that's what? Mold, right? And they have fuzzy appearance, and they, they grow aerial hyphae, and then they grow into the substance as well, right? They have the hyphae that grow in, they release enzymes, they absorb and uh, their food. So do bacteria. They release their enzymes, right, and then absorb their food. So these these ones, and you notice that we've got different colors and different shapes to the growths on these plates, right, and these all have to do with different types of organisms. Right? These are major sources of environmental contamination of our cultures, right? So. When we get contamination, where did it come from? Well, it could come from the air, it could come from our hands, it could come from the desktop, right? It could come from several different sources. So we're at to incubate them at two different temperatures, right? So what is the likely source or reservoir for 37? What is 37 related to? Human body temperature. And the other one is room temperature, right? 25 that we use. So the Celsius scale is actually based on the properties of water. So um, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Body temperature. Um, so skin, soil, remember I said as you go to your core body temperature is, is 98. But as you go to your extremities, right, your skin is much cooler um, around 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, apparently... It figures out to 77. I guess I'm not reading my thermometer right. 25 and 77. Um, and zero is freezing. Right? So it's the properties of water zero to 100 for Celsius scale, which is 32 in Fahrenheit. So if they're so, how do you think they survive at room temperature without nutrients? So organisms that come from us, right? You sneeze, right? Touch something, spit. I hope not. Right. <laughs> um, how do these, these survive in the environment without nutrients? Right? Because they're, if they're outside of you and they're on the desktop, do they have food? They do very little, right? This is why they don't grow to large numbers on our desktop so that we see them. So without food, you're not going to grow or you're not going to grow very fast. Well, guess what? Bacteria have gotten very good at going without food. They're very good at starving, right? And this is why, right, infectious disease can spread, especially with bacteria, is that some of them can be in the environment for periods of time, right? And you pick them up and they can cause to make you sick because they're still alive, right? They're not dead. Others are much more susceptible. So some organisms grow better at room temperature, where others grow better at body temperature. Most organisms that grow at body temperature can still grow at room temperature, but probably not as fast. And the survival on a desktop or other location without nutrients can be explained in several ways. They may actually be nutrients available, right, that we're not aware of, small amounts. Remember, we're talking about the microbial world, 
or the organism may be in a relatively inert state, or what we call stasis, in which nutrients are not required. They're just kind of chilling. Like I said, they've gotten good at starting. Some organisms produce highly resistant resting stages called endospores, or sometimes just spores for short. Um, and for some of them, the spores are reproductive. For bacteria, endospores are not reproductive. But in the case of um, mold, fungi like that, it is reproductive. And cysts, um, which are very common in protozoa, single-celled organisms that we'll be looking at next week, um, eukaryotic organisms. This is a resting stage, right, where they insist, they encapsulate themselves, and they're not actually metabolizing, but they're still alive, right? They're kind of hibernating. They're dormant. So why would we get different appearing colonies on these plates? So they talk about, I think, I think they number in plates one and two, unfortunately. We're referring to the desktop. Remember, we took a desktop sample and we're going to grow one at 25 and one at 37. So these are some prior examples I had. So I had. Lots of growth on this desktop one at 37. Where do these organisms probably come from? If they like 37, they probably came from us, right? And then the ones that are liking 25 probably came from the air, the environment. And in fact, this one came out really good that particular semester because look at the air one, look at this pinkish colonies and these yellow ones. Look very similar, right, as to the growth that we got at the 25, where our fingers, a lot of the growth looks very similar, right, to the one that grew at 37. So think about what type of organisms grow best at the different temperatures, right? So again, what came from us, from our fingers, is probably what's growing best from the desktop sample. What's coming from the air, right, grows best at that cooler temperature. So the other cool thing that we'll see this semester is that temperature can affect the growth of organisms. Um, and so we work with one particular organism in this lab, um, Ceratia mercescens. And this one grows red, produces red pigmentation at 25 degrees, but at 37 degrees, it does not produce that pigmentation. It's white. Uh, and this is the one um, that potentially you, you have in your showers and stuff that makes them kind of pink, that discolorization you have. This is probably the organism that's growing. This environmental organism. So all organisms have what we call cardinal growth temperatures. And these are, it's a range of temperatures that are best for the organism. They're, everyone has their minimum, right? That if you go any lower than that, they could potentially die, right? Or especially bacteria that are really good at that low stasis, they're just going to stop growing. Optimum is obviously the what? The best temperature, right? That's going to grow the fastest, the best under ideal conditions. Every organism also has a maximum. And you'll notice that the growth rates quite dramatically drops off when we increase in temperature. Anyone know the reasoning for this? What happens at the cellular level it usually leads to cell death because of heat? What gets destroyed? So what are, what, what are nutrients inside your cells? What are, what are things that we ingest? If you look at your foods are made out of when we think of molecularly. Sugars, proteins, nucleic acids, remember these things? Okay. Which one of them is most susceptible to heating and are the workhorses that run our cells? Actually do all the work. Proteins. 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 And their structure is important to their functionality. And that's why heating really can destroy them, as well as our membranes and DNA structure, right? These are all very important things. But the main thing that gets destroyed is proteins. And this irreversible damage, right? So this is the fried egg experiment, right? This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs, right? This is your brain. This is proteins on heat, right? What happens to an egg when you fry it? It dramatically changes, right? It's coagulation of proteins. Can you reverse that? No. 
So the same thing for an organism. When you get destruction of enough proteins, everything stops. And the next thing is death. Okay. So we use this against microorganisms all the time. What do we do to our food to kill them? We heat them to a particular temperature, right? Depending on the food source and the potential pathogens that may be present. So there are organisms that have a wide range, right? The ones we worry about where we would fall are what are called mesophiles. We like it right there in the middle, right? Psychophiles and psychotrophs, they can grow at cool temperatures. The scary thing is like uh, listeria, right? Can grow at refrigerator temperatures, right? For most people, it doesn't create a problem, but pregnant women, elderly, immunocompromised can really cause a problem. Which is why our Blue Bell ice cream got taken away from us right now, right? Not cool. It's not growing in the freezer but you still don't want that contamination. Uh, then you have ones that can grow in hydrothermal vents and compost heaps. Actually, what creates the heat is the bacterial digestion. And then we have our good old autoclave here. And uh, the plates, after they become all nice and growy and yucky, we're going to stick them in the autoclave. We share our stink with biology lab. <laughs> One of the biology labs is where our autoclaves are set up. So. That cart that's by the door is our disposal cart. So this is where we put things. I once came in here, some other class was using our lab, and they put their drinks on that cart. I was like, that is the worst place in this entire lab you could put your drinks. That's where we put all the stuff that has grown for the lab prep person to come and take it and go out and it before it throws it away. Um, so otherwise, this room is probably the cleanest room on campus because we disinfect our countertops all the time. Right, so the plates, right, we're definitely going to sterilize and destroy. Um, our tabletops, well, physically, we can't go bring them to the autoclave, and the autoclave is tiny, too. Do we need that level of clean on our desktops? Do we need to completely kill everything? No. Disinfecting is sufficient. Aseptic technique, which you guys are going to learn next week, is sufficient to limit contamination. Like I said, this is probably the cleanest room on campus because you know these tabletops have been disinfected. I have no idea about the desks in your lecture rooms. When the last time they were actually wiped down and disinfected? No clue. Maybe once a semester. <laughs> we're lucky. Right? So these plates should have a much higher cell density than any growth that would happen on our tables, right? And that's because there's a food source there, right? We put them on these plates, we gave them a lot of food. So they're going to grow. So here's our standard light microscopes. Um, these are our eyepieces, or usually referred to as oculars. There's actually only one, right? So the question asks you when we figure out uh, magnification, binocular means you're looking through two. When I when I was in school, <laughs> in like the seventh grade, I remember, we didn't even have light sources. We used a little reflective mirror, brought our microscopes to the <laughs> window to get sunlight. <laughs> that makes me really old now. Um, <laughs> and uh, we only had one eyepiece to look through, one ocular. Okay, now most of the microscopes are binocular, which are much easier for viewing, right? We can, and you can adjust these for your eye width and everything. I'll show you guys how to do that. And you'll have your very own microscope that just you use, well, just you and someone else in the other classes, but you'll be assigned a numbered scope. Um, so that way we can punish you too when you don't clean your microscope. We'll know who is not doing it, which won't be my class. Never is. <laughs> um, so you can comfortably look through both, right? No squinting in this lab. You'll have a headache by the end of lab. But magnification-wise, the image is only being magnified once and then reflected to the other ocular for you. Does that make sense? So just one lens, one ocular lens, and this is the one that produces the virtual image from the real image that's magnified by your objective lenses. And, and, the, and, and it'll almost seem like it's floating in space, right? because it's, it's literally projected in space, what you're seeing. So that virtual image is what's produced by the oculars when it magnifies the real image. 
So like I said, it appears like within or below the microscope. We have several objective lenses on our microscopes, and these are the first to magnify, right? So they're right here on this revolving nose piece. And it's really important that when we're using this that we, this actually, most of them have ridges on it, so that you can move the revolving nose piece. You shouldn't actually grab the lenses themselves because they're screwed into that nose piece, and over time they'll unscrew and fall out and break. So I'm going to teach you guys proper microscope usage. So we, when we use the objective lenses, if you could see just that image, that would be what we call the real image. That is later then magnified by the oculars to produce the virtual. The condenser is another lens on your microscope that's really important. It's in the stage itself, and it condenses the light from the light source, right, onto the slide and helps focus it so that um, it goes into the lenses of the objective lens and then the ocular so we can see. So why aren't we magnifying both oculars? Because we're only magnifying once, right? So when you actually look at whether it be the ocular, right, or the objective lenses, they will have stamped on them a number in front of an X. The X means multiplied by. So that's the level of magnification. So these are examples that they give you in your book. I have to say I've never seen a microscope with 15x oculars. I've actually seen one with 20x though. Most of them are standardly 10. So these are really weird numbers. It's just to teach you guys, right? What do you multiply for magnification? Objective times ocular for total magnification. I promise I will always give you easy numbers, but we also have calculators in the lab. So down at the bottom of your page, I have our actual numbers for our actual microscopes in this lab. So, and they're color coded as well. So notice the colored rings on these objective lenses, right? This is a standardized color code. What we call a scanning objective lens is just a 4X, so this is just four times magnified. I mean, not much more than a little handheld magnifier. And then times the oculars, which on ours, as I said, are 10x. You only get a total magnification of about 40. We only have a few specimens we're going to look at next week that are that large that we're, you can see well enough detail in the whole organism at scanning. After that lab, that focusing at that level is a complete waste of time with bacteria. We actually start out at low power when we're dealing with bacteria. This is your 10x objective times the 10 ocular, 100 times magnified. Will steam, still seem like absolutely nothing when you're dealing with bacteria. And then also high dry, which means you do not apply oil, is 40x times 10x is 400x. This, again, is not enough magnification to visually see the bacteria to the level we need to. So again, typically I don't even bother focusing at this one and just skip over to my oil. This one we do actually have to apply oil. And it needs to be wiped off at the end of lab from the lens. We don't want to leave it on there for long periods of time. So throughout the lab, if you're looking at your slides, you don't have to continue wiping just when you get done. And this will give us a total magnification of 1,000 because the objective lens itself is 100 times the ocular, which is 10. So the thousand times, as I said, it's still not going to seem very big, very magnified. Other things that come into play with using microscopy, especially light microscopy, is what we call resolution or resolving power. Most people have a pretty well understanding of this nowadays with our souped up phones. Everybody seems to have a camera on it. And some cameras are better than others. Why? The resolution, right? how much information in that case it could store, right? Because when you blow it up, if you don't have all that information, then it gets blurry, okay? So in the case here, um, it's not necessarily information, it's the lenses and how good they are at focusing light, right? To focus and be able to see a clear, crisp image. But this can also be mathematically formulated, right? So yeah, a little bit of math, sorry, you guys. In order to calculate, um, limit of resolution or resolving power. 
and it actually will be a distance because the wavelength of light factors into this. So that's the top of our fraction, what we call the numerator. And wavelengths of light are measured in nanometers. NM is the abbreviation. And then we have to look at what's called the numerical aperture of the lenses that we're using. Now there are two lenses that affect the light on your microscope. One is the condenser in the stage, right? It has a set numerical aperture. And another way to better understand this is whenever you get glasses, right, you have a specific prescription. And this is adjusting for your lenses in your eye, right, which are have different focal length. So to be able to see and help your eyes, because some lenses can't be manipulated within the level with the muscles in your eyes, so you need that extension additional corrective lens, right? But there's a number to that lens, so they know how to make it specifically for you, for that adjustment. So the same thing here, this is like the prescription for these lenses, right? This is their focal point, this is their number. This is their numerical aperture. And this is set, it can't change, right? Because it's a, it's a glass lens, unlike the lens in our eyes, where we can actually change it and adjust it. That's why you can see near and far, if yours are still doing that or ever did that. <laughs> Make sense? So since it's a number, and as I said, the condenser is going to focus light onto your specimen, and then the objective lens, right, is, is also needs to be able to have light to create that uh, real image that's then going to be turned into the virtual by the next set, which is your objective lens. I mean, ocular. Too many O's. So we can actually get a number and this correlates to if you have two objects close together. And I have one glassware. Jade, are you nearsighted or farsighted? Do you need those glasses to see me? You do. Okay, can you take them off for a second? Let's see. How many fingers am I holding up? Three. Three. Okay, put them back on. She got it. Sometimes they don't get it. You pro were they clear? No, they were fuzzy. You guesstimated by how, the width, right? Yeah. So there's much more things that come into play in our vision than you realize, okay? Um, but sometimes I'll hold up two or three and they can't tell, right? Because it, it's too far away, it's too blurry, they can't guesstimate how many fingers I'm holding up. Puts her glasses back on, she can clearly see, even though they're really close together, that I was holding three fingers up, correct? Okay. So that distance we're talking about is a minimum distance. Right? So when we calculate this number, it has to be exactly at least this far apart or they're going to blur together. Right? If I hold my fingers up like this, you would probably get it no problem right? because the distance between those fingers right? helps in the visualization. Make sense? So we can mathematically calculate this and you will need to and you need to know the formula. This formula is basically a fraction though, right? So a little review on fractions. We're going to talk about how important this number is and what factors affect it. So what fraction of that pie would you say that slice is? An eighth, a sixth, right? Remember, this equation is a fraction. Wavelengths on the top, numerical aperture is a condenser and objective at the bottom. So Oh, what's, what's left? Seven-eighths, right? If we say it's one-eighth, then it's seven-eighths, right? We have to take into account the whole thing. Which is larger? Seven-eighths. How do you know that? The top number, the numerator, is larger, right? More pieces. That part over the whole amount, right? Your bottom is your whole amount. The top is the part, right? So you want one-eighth or seven-eighths. Depends on how hungry you are, right? Okay. So according to our formula, which one, re which number represents wavelength? Numerator, right? So which one's smaller in this case? One or seven? One. So it says, assuming all variables remain constant, explain why light of a shorter wavelength would produce a clearer image than light of a longer wavelength. So in the case of resolution, do we want a big number or a small number? 
We want small. We want to be able to put them as close as possible and still see them. So we want the smallest fraction. So which one again is the smallest fraction? One eighth because the one is the smallest. And what does one represent? Wavelength. So short wavelength, best image. Still with me? Small is good in this case. But too small can create problems. So, light has a certain wavelength. Visible light has a specific wavelength, right? So, visible light that you can actually see, right? The violet is 400 nanometers, that's the smallest, right? Up to the red colors is 700 nanometers. We got to, if we're using our eyes to detect, we've got to stay in the visible light spectrum, right? So, what color filter do you think most of our microscopes have? It's going to give us the smallest wavelength of light. Blue. If you look at your microscope, it doesn't make the stuff look blue, but it helps us filter that smaller wavelength of light, give her a crisper image. So why do we, why is it limiting? Because we got to stay in the visible spectrum. Can you see UV light? No, you cannot, right? There are some microscopes that utilize UV light to create fluorescence that you can see, right? That's within the visible light spectrum. So when the organisms absorb the UV light, they bounce back the fluorescent light, which is in the visible light spectrum. And then of course, x-rays, Right, things like that. We don't see images are taken of that type of thing. Electron microscopes, right? You're not seeing electrons with your eyes. A machine generates an image for you based on the information. So this goes into some specific explanations. I'm not gonna or did we take that one out? No. Okay. Yeah, we have to stay within the visible light spectrum. most common is the blue. So on a given microscope, if we get, they give us this information, if they've got a filter that's generating 520 nanometers of wavelength, remember that's the top of our equation, at the <laughs> bottom they're telling you numerical apertures, and these are always going to be like a decimal number, right next to on your objective lenses or your condenser. Um, especially with your objective, you have the magnification, and next to it you're going to have your, your numerical aperture. You can use to calculate resolution. So for this one, right, um, is 520 over 1.5 when you add the two numerical aperture together. It gives you a numerical value for resolution of 347 nanometers. So remember, that's the minimum distance two objects would need to be apart for you to dissolve, resolve them as two separate objects. So the next half of the problem says, okay, what if we put two things 330 nanometers apart? Will you see them in separate or will they blur together? They're going to blur because it's less than our minimum, right? Our minimum is 347. These guys are too close together. indistinguishable. Alright, so for the next one they said they're just going to switch out which objective lens. So the um, the only number that's changing from last time is um, the objective lens. So instead of being 1.25 or 25 or two, what, what was it? 0.25? Instead of being 0.25 at low power, now we're going to go up to high uh, high dry, which is 8.5. So we get a better resolution, right? 
which we would need at the higher magnifications, yeah? Makes sense. So now, we, they could be 248 nanometers apart, right? So if we put two things 250, are we going to see them? Yeah. <laughs> it's close, right? But it's at least the minimum, right? It's just right outside the minimum. So if you remember, that's your minimum distance, right? Your limit of resolution is a minimum, right? How close they can potentially be together, and you're going to see them as being separate. So the last one is our microscopes. Our microscopes are 1.25 for the oil immersion and for the condenser which gives us about 200 nanometers, which that seems like really small, right? <laughs> Wait. Wait for it. <laughs> okay. This is bacteria. These are some rod shaped and chains. Here's some yeast. These guys are kind of tiny. You can see them budding here. Here's some red blood cells, right? Here's some bacteria, uh, staphylococci actually, right? Uh, this is under standard light microscope oil immersion. Right? Not a whole lot of detail, huh? This is a cool interactive website. This is the, almost the last thing. I want to go over, you know, we're about ready to be done, huh? Um, types of microscopes. So there's three different types of microscopes that your book talks about. Bright field microscopy is a type of light microscopy that we do in lab. Um, where the background's quite bright and the organisms themselves um, are either colored or have been stained and they kind of absorb the light. So bright field referring to the background is bright. Dark field, and we could do this with our microscope, just turn off the light from below and shine it from the side. The background would be dark and the organisms would be illuminated like you see in this picture. These are two euglena, same um, microscope, just different lighting. Same sample, too. This one down here, when you compare it to the other two, there's more you see, right? This is, again, another type of lycrospomy using additional filters, which adjust the wavelengths of light out of phase with each other, which is why it's called phase contrast. So the phase of the wavelength of light is what's creating the contrast here. Um, and so you're able to see. And the nice thing about this is that most commonly how we create contrast with our bacteria is we stain them. The problem with that is when you stain them, you kill them. <laughs> and um, so sometimes we want to see them alive and maybe moving, right? Uh, in that case, we can't stain them. And so we have to manipulate light to help us be able to see them better. We can't have blinding light light in order to see them. Other types of microscopy, like I said, utilize UV light. Um, and this is usually if the organisms have fluorescent ability or if we're using dyes that have fluorescent ability. UV light is damaging to the eyes. These microscopes have to have special filters on them so that you don't hurt your eyes um, when you're observing this. So the last thing is this cool interactive website uh, that a student turned me on to a while ago and is linked up to our Blackboard in that. And this one is interactive in that um, it shows you size comparison when you move this off to the side. And notice um, measurement-wise. So nanometers is, are smaller than micrometers, right? Um, so a grain of salt, right, in comparison to an amoeba, or, right? These guys are in the micrometers category. They don't put the abbreviations here. I wish they did. M. And so then we're going a thousand times smaller when we get to nanometers in a moment. So look at this paramecium, a human egg, which is the largest cell in a woman's body. So it's got all the food and everything. Sperm are just mobile DNA, but they're important. We need that DNA to make a whole baby, not just a half. Right. Skin cells, right? Eukaryotic cells, red blood cell, baker's yeast. Look at how small they are in comparison to one of our red blood cells. Our chromosome, and that's in condensed form. And then finally, right? We're talking about 0.6 micrometers, right? Or, or uh, six, six, 
it'll be 600 nanometers, right? Is the width of this guy. So it would be 3,000 nanometers per E. coli. And he's covered in flagella. He's kind of cool. I like it. Okay. Uh, lysosome, right? These are organelles inside of our cells. Look at our mitochondria. They're bigger than poor old E. coli. And then, of course, the things we won't see with our light microscopes, right? Because this is right at the range, 200 nanometers, the measles virus, right? You're not going to see this kind of stuff under a light microscope. You just don't have the resolution. You need electron microscopes, right? Uh, influenza virus, HIV virus, the much smaller viruses, herpes viruses, right? The ribosomes that make the proteins in our cells, the awesome protein antibodies that save our lives, Look how tiny these things are. Hemoglobin. And then the source, the important backbone molecule of all organic molecules is carbon, which is why we can use carbon dating, right, to determine how long ago something, you know, the decay rate of that element, right? All our proteins and everything, carbon is the backbone, right? And they actually have microscopes that can go down to this level now. Atomic force microscopes. Pretty cool stuff. Alright guys, sorry it took so long. <laughs>